Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Delucio, and now let's get on with the show. Welcome back to the Drive On Podcast, everyone. Today, my guest is Virginia Cruz. Virginia served in the Army and is currently serving as a Navy Reserve Officer, and she's also the author of the book, The Soldier's Guide to PTSD, A No-Shit Guide to Reclaiming Your Life. And we're here to talk today about her book and uh, her experiences that led her to write this book and uh, get it straight from the source. So welcome to the show, Virginia. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and your background? Scott, thank you so much for having me on. It's really nice to connect with your viewers and your listeners. Thank you. Um, so I don't have a really cool origin story. I didn't, you know, full disclosure, uh, not a cool origin story. I didn't intend on growing up and becoming a trauma therapist. And I would hope that nobody does. So I enlisted in the army in 1997 and I'm an Arabic speaker. So I, as you can imagine, right at the kickoff of the war cycle, spent a lot of time in Iraq. And it was after my third deployment in 2008 that I was not okay. And uh, got into some trouble at work and I was command directed to go to see a psychiatrist. So I was living in Germany at the time and I went to a major military treatment facility. And I knew that I wasn't okay. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew something was wrong. I was having hallucinations. That's when you see or hear or smell or taste or even feel things that we ostensibly know aren't there. I was drinking like a fish, which um, even Europeans were kind of like, mm, I don't know. That's a lot of wine, lady. Um, I was drinking constantly. I was not sleeping. I was blowing up all of my relationships to include my marriage. Um, and yeah, I was just not okay. I was, I was just going off like that. And I knew something was wrong. And so when I went to go see this psychiatrist, I was really happy to find that they were an active duty military service member. Um, what we call a slick sleeve, uh, somebody who had never been deployed before. This was an 06 male colonel who was working in this military treatment facility. And I poured my heart out to him. I told him everything that had been going on and I knew I needed help. And when I was done with that interview, he looked at me and said, you know, Virginia, I can tell you're really struggling, but I can't help you if you don't choose to be honest with me. And I was super confused by that. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he clarified and he said, you know, we all know that women don't serve in combat. I wish I were making that up, but that's just not a thing. And, you know, I wasn't an infantry like you or, or, you know, special warfare like your brother, but that was a real kick in the teeth. And um, it really kicked me while I was down. Mm -hmm. it, I found it to be belittling, um, really dismissing, and it made me even more hopeless than I was before. Uh, you know, full disclosure, I was pretty suicidal before I went and saw him. I was thinking about suicide pretty much every day and using it as a coping mechanism. Um, just thinking about it made me feel better. And after that, it, um, yeah, it got, it got worse. It actually got worse. And it, it was at that point though, Scott, that I decided, you know, if I don't figure this out, like if I don't know shit, reclaim my life, if I don't get my stuff together, I'm going to die. I'm either going to kill myself or whatever this is that's going on in my head is going to kill me. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do. I went, I didn't, you know, went to grad school and, and here we are, you know, 13 years later, and here I am talking to you. And one of the first gigs that I got after I was newly licensed is I started working in an inpatient treatment facility. So that means that's an inpatient hospital. Um, inpatient is just a clinical term that means you don't go home at night. You actually stay at the hospital. So it's kind of being locked up. But this particular inpatient treatment program was for military service members, active duty, who were dealing with what we call uh, co-occurring disorders. So that's a fancy ass term that means that two things happening at the same time. So for the most part, it was PTSD and alcohol abuse, you know, as as. We all know it's, that's 
you know, usually the couple that that comes into the party together, but also folks who are dealing with depression or anxiety or OCD or eating disorders. And my job was to teach them about PTSD. And so they gave me this really smart curriculum that was written by PhDs, and it was very clinically astute. I mean, it was it was good stuff. Told me all about my amygdala and the frontal lobes and the brain mechanism, and all my students went to sleep. And I was teaching this curriculum, which was correct. And I thought, man, I, you know, I had an NCO, uh, my first tour, who said, who used to always say, "Hey, are you picking up what I'm putting down?" And I love that expression. And I realized that I need to create a class where somebody is going to be picking up what I'm putting down. So I thought to myself, what is it that I needed to know when I was at my lowest point? And what I really needed to know back then was, what exactly is this? What exactly is PTSD? Don't sugarcoat it. Don't give me a bunch of psychobabble nonsense. Tell me word for word. I'm not stupid. Tell me exactly what this is. Give me some courses of action. What do I do about it? Then how do I execute? I needed some good ORM. I just needed to figure out what is this? Am I crazy? Am I legit crazy? Or is there an explanation to this? What do I do about it? And then moreover, how do I get the buy-in? How can I repair my relationships with my family? How can I talk to my chain of command or my HR department or other people who may not necessarily care what I'm going through, but I need their buy-in because... Um, you know, eventually once I've recovered from PTSD or, you know, alcohol or drug abuse, I have to go back to work unless I'm independently wealthy. And then how do I maintain this sort of, you know, how do I maintain these gains? How do I keep from relapsing? So we think about relapse, Scott, a lot in terms of drugs and alcohol, but we can relapse in anything. This is just means going back to an earlier point. So we can relapse with PTSD or depression. So I needed to know the steps about how do I get social support, which sounds really simple, but in the military, you know, we have, you got your fire team, you've got built-in friends, you got, you have brothers. It is what it is, you know, like it or not, they, they are your siblings. Right. When we leave the military, how do we make friends? Not intuitive, not easy. And especially if you're male. Because it's weird. It is weird. As a female, I can go up to, you know, I can be like, girl, I love your hair. And boom, we're friends. We've got, and we're going to go and, uh, you know, hang out next week. Guys, not so much. So we talk about that in the book um, and really about boundaries. How do I make healthy boundaries? How do I protect my gains? Even if I'm in the military, how do I deal with a toxic leader? It used to be a big topic in the war college back in like 2010, 2011. I guess it's not anymore. So I guess we don't have them anymore in the military. Maybe, Maybe. the problem's magically gone, right? I mean, that's, it has to be. If they're, that's, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> they just sprinkled some magic dust on it and it's gone, you know? <laughs> Legit. So, how, you know, how do we, how can we maintain boundaries and, right. uh, and how can we, how can we protect ourselves so that we are not feeling suicidal? So that we're not feeling homicidal. We don't want to schwack anyone else either. That's, you know, that's jail time. Right. And uh, so I wrote this curriculum, you know, I rewrote the curriculum and I've taught it to literally, you know, over a thousand service members at this point. And I've been working with military service members uh, with PTSD and moral injury um, for a while. And then my students stayed on me. Uh, They stayed in touch and they stayed on me and um, they said, you know, you got to get this out in a book. And so finally I was like, enough, enough. And uh, Scott Mendoza, enough. I heard you and um, wrote the book. And really it's, it's my love letter. It is my love letter to soldiers. You know, Uh, I, I, I got a commission in the, in the Naval Reserve, but you know, in my heart, I'm still a soldier. And, and I'm actually time off from all reserve duty right now, just full disclosure, because I, I'm finishing up my PhD because apparently I just, you know, have too much time. You uh, Too and, much time. And you, 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 that's what, that's the thing that you said you knew how to do. You just went yeah. back to school. So too, why not? too much time, too much money. So yeah. Well, how can I waste 
Oh, I know. I'll go back and finish that up. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but this book really is my, it's my love letter to, to all of you. And because I, I was really looking for, a, this is what the book that I was looking for when I was at my sickest, because I remember I went to Dr. Google and I, you know, when I got that di- and I didn't get a diagnosis of PTSD, by the way, I, sh- I should be, I should be very Pacific as opposed to being Atlantic. I, I, after I saw that psychiatrist, I was labeled as having a personality disorder, which is um, really insulting and pretty hard to shake. Uh, but as I've talked to service members and veterans over the years, unfortunately, I found that my, my experience isn't very unique. And that's especially true for women, people of color and people who identify as queer. You know, unfortunately that, that happens. Um, there can be gaslighting within the mental health community. Um, you know, it's easy for folks who are, you know, door knockers, bell ringers, infantry members. Um, but sometimes, unfortunately, other people's experiences are dismissed. And there is an attitude of, well, you don't deserve to have PTSD because right. fill in the blank. And so yeah. go, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, no, that that's fine, and and I, I, I want to I want to really like kind of dive into this book. I but at the same time, um, you know, when I, when I was when I read this book, uh, you know, I I was taking a lot of good good stuff out of it. So I want to I want to go into like every single detail, but at the same time, I don't want to give the whole book away. And you know, I want people to go out and get it uh, and and read your book. So so that's that's kind of, there's kind of a fine balance here. So I don't want to get you have a like giveaway, so though. far into it. <laughs> well, we, that, I mean, we, away, Scott. We, we, we are given, we are given all your listeners and all your viewers, the first two chapters for free. They can go to the, right. yeah, they can go to the soldiers and uh, give us your email. We're going to put you on our newsletter list and where you can have subscribe later. Um, but we'll give you the first two chapters, which cover uh, the diagnostic criteria of PTSD because Lottie Dottie, everybody deserves to understand what PTSD isn't, what it is, and how we can recover from it. So we we really wanted to give that away to everyone who will take it. And and that's great. And and when I when I was reading this book, the thing that I enjoyed the most about it um, was that it wasn't written in this super technical, you know, jargon mumbo jumbo and all that kind of stuff going into it. It was it was explained in an easy to understand way for, for someone who isn't trained as a mental health professional. Um, you know, I was able to walk away with a whole bunch of information that was, you know, easy to understand just by, by, uh, you know, going through your book. Um, and, and it's, I think the same thing for, for anyone who picks up this book, they're going to be able to, to take away some actionable advice and, and actually, you know, even just in the first couple of chapters, they'll be able to get that, the diagnosis, uh, you know, understand what the criteria are anyways for the, that type of diagnosis. And, and so I, I think that, that giving that little teaser that the first couple chapters is, is going to um, be a really good way to uh, get people to understand, okay, is this the book for me? You know, it, once when we, we figure out, you know, the diagnosis, you know, criteria that, that goes into it, then we can understand, do I, do I need to keep reading? If, if this doesn't apply to me, okay. But, you know, but if it does, then maybe we need to keep reading. And, and some of the stuff that you, you talk about um, really, uh, you know, like you, you started to, to mention before, um, you know, some of the, the, the rumors that flo- float around about PTSD, you know, um, you know, and is it curable or, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think it can be, but you say otherwise in, in the book. And there's, there's a whole bunch of other rumors that are out there um, that, that um, you dispel a lot of the myths in there. And so that, I think that that's a, a good place to start. Okay. I, I really appreciate that feedback, Scott. Thank you so much. You know, I, I didn't start out as trauma therapist. I started out as a linguist. And so I'm always thinking in terms of language because language really, it matters. Mm-hmm. What we say, how we communicate matters. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? If not, there's no sense in me putting it down. I'm wasting my time. 
And, you know, that was why one of the first things we did is we made this into an audiobook. And um, Kelly Taker did the recording, so you won't have to listen to me drone on. Um, we, we found a fantastic narrator, but only because, I, I mean, I'll speak personally, you know, I like I'm reading your book right now, Scott, and um, who tough. It is a tough read. I love it. And I would recommend Surviving Sun to, to anyone who, who is listening. Really fantastic work. Um, but the first thing we did was make it into an audiobook because I very rarely read books. Mm-hmm. I, and it's not, it's not, you know, and that's, I'm not an anti-intellectual. Who's got time? I, there is one thing I do have, and that's a commute. And that's why I love podcasts like yours. Um, because I can go, you know, I may not have an hour uh, to read something, but I do have 30 minutes, you know, while waiting in traffic or going to work. And so we went ahead and put it on audiobook, but, you know, language matters. So it's, it's really important to me that this was very plainly spoken, but not, not, not pedantic, not stupid. I mean, I don't have to talk down to anyone right. at the day service members are incredibly smart i mean we train 18 year olds how to fix nuclear reactors and jet planes we can explain ptsd and if we're being honest and for real you don't need a phd for this this is not rocket surgery this is not this is not high math this is ptsd is unbelievably straightforward and simple especially in terms of a mental health diagnosis it's a really straightforward disorder. And that word disorder, I want to I want to hit the pause button take me from it because a lot of people take exception to the word disorder. And I, I want to tell everyone just calm down from it. So that's a clinical word that means that your walking, talking, everyday life is being affected by your symptoms. Your life is out of order because of what you're going through. So that word disorder doesn't have judgment behind it. And it's not intended to. But I, I recognize that it can feel like it. But please right. know that that's not the intent behind that. Anyway, to make a long story longer, PTSD is a very normal, very, very normal reaction to a very abnormal set of circumstances. It is completely logical. It is our brain's way. Our brain has two main jobs. Number one, to keep us alive. Keep us breathing, keep us moving. Number two, to make meaning, whether we have all the information or not. I say again, whether we have all the information or not. And because I'm talking to you and you're listening or what, you know, watching this podcast, your brain is doing his job. Now, I, I refer to my brain as a he. Um, I love my brain. And, and he, but I, I think it's easier within the context of PTSD to think of your brain as a separate person. I okay. uh, think about it as that, you know, that one team member, uh, that one younger sibling who, you know, is always trying to help, but just can't seem to get it right. It's like, you know, if, if your child come in, comes into the garage and like, dad, can I help you clean? And you're like, oh, sure. You don't want to say no. But at the same time, you know, you're going to have to clean everything again. It's sort of the same thing. Your brain really is going through flips and this really Herculean task to keep you alive, to keep you safe. So that whole idea of stay alert, stay alive. So if we can see PTSD in that context, all the symptoms, all the criteria are very, very logical. So we think about those, um, those intrusion symptoms, criterion bravo, those intrusion symptoms. Think about uh, an intruder comes into your home, tries to take all your shit when you're not paying attention. That's the same thing that intrusion symptoms do. Try to knock into your brain, shake you up when you're not ready. Now, within the context of PTSD, think about your baby brother brain, trauma brain, stay alert, stay alive. So those are things like flashbacks. And that's when, and you talk about that in Surviving Sun also. So Mm -hmm. flashbacks, a lot of times we see that in the movies. And if it were like that, that'd be that would still suck, but it wouldn't suck as much as a real flashback. So in the movie, we see it as kind of a little movie, you know, a little, little montage with, you know, some music over it in slow motion. No. And we jump on, you know, whatever flashbacks in in real life though, can be a lot more uniquely terrifying because we literally feel 
as if we are back in that event. So, and it comes full sense. It, it does. Comes yeah. Tasting moon dust, you're smelling burnt hair. It, it's it comes full sense, and and there's no layover music, and it doesn't slow down. Bummer. No. Um, yeah, but the, I mean, so those intrusion symptoms, your your brain is trying to keep you alert because if you're relaxing, you're in danger. You're in danger, mm-hmm. and so you know, think about it. when, when you go outside the wire, I think thinking about your brain in terms of your, your brain is always getting ready for fight, flight, freeze, freeze is kind of the redheaded stepchild of trauma, which clearly I take very personally, but, <laughs> um, you know, we don't talk about it a lot, but, uh, here's the thing. The army does a really good job of trying to train the freeze out of us. That's why we do live fire exercises. That's why as an infantry man, you, you know, you know, all of those just by, I mean, you know, all of your formations by rote. you could call in a nine line today, just as well as you could from the field. I mean, it's something that your body, you know, the army has trying to free to freeze the train out of you. And I mean, we've all been through basic training and the hand grenade range and you you see that pucker factor. It's like, Oh shit. Like what's about to go down. You really want me to pull this bin? (laughs) Like, are you, are you for real? Are you sure? But you know, every time your body, you know, you are in danger, whether it is, you know, and I think going on a convoy, you know, real or threatened. So every time you leave the wire, um, you potentially could get schwacked. We, we, Mm -hmm. you could get hit. Now let's say you never do get hit. Thankfully. You're, you're, you're a smart cookie. You listen to your S2, hopefully, or at least you watch the news. You know that, every, that convoys do get schwacked. You know, you know the routes get, that get hit the most. And so every time you leave the wire, your body and your brain gear up for that. It's freaking miraculous, to be honest with you. You know, unless you're living it, then it's not so much. But, it, it, you know, 2020 hindsight. So a lot of things start happening your heart starts beating. The reason for that is to get all the blood to your muscles so you can start preparing for fight, flight, freeze, hopefully fight, you know, if you're in a convoy or flight, if you have to. Um, Your eyes start to dilate. You start to shake or you start to sweat. You're, uh, you know, the part of your brain, your frontal lobes that are really responsible for memory, think about them as kind of shutting down. You're not, this ain't Disney. You're not here to take pictures and and wear mouse ears, you know? So, uh, you know, that goes out to lunch because you're not taking pictures. This is not, this is not the time for snapshots. Um, So everything is going into that survival mode. So that's why we tend to forget a lot of people, you know, I won't say we writ large because, you know, there's always exceptions, but a lot of folks, um, myself included, don't remember big chunks of our deployments. We don't remember big chunks of our trauma. And it's not because there's something wrong with us. It's because your brain is trying to keep you alive. There, there's a purpose. There's a purpose here. So, you know, you're leaving the wire and, and whether you get hit or not, your body is gearing up for that fight, flight, freeze. Um, and you know, outside of the context uh, of, of PTSD, it's, you know, we can really look back on that and say, you know, I, I don't remember that. What, what could be wrong with me? You know, or I'm having hallucinations, you know, I'm legit seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling things that I know aren't there. I hear people screaming my name in the middle of the night. I live with my dog in, you know, on a mountain, I'm all unabombering it. Um, Let's talk about the why behind that. Now, I'll I'll speak as a therapist on this. So I personally have never seen a case of PTSD without hallucinations. I wanna say that one more time for the folks in the back. I have never personally seen a case of PTSD without hallucinations. Here's why hallucinations within the context of PTSD make a ton of sense. If we are trying to relax, sleep, meditate, pray, our brain, our trauma brain. Remember our baby brother brain is freaking the F out. He's like, Hey, 
you know, hold on, Scott. Don't you remember that the world is a dangerous place? We could get schwacked at any minute. Hey, I know what'll help you to remember. Let me give you some of these intrusion symptoms. Let me go ahead and give you, let me go ahead and, and manufacture a gunshot sound. Let me give you the smell of, uh, of something burning. Let me give you the taste of moon dust. I was just talking to a client the other day who, um, who smells uh, prayer oil uh, from a certain mission that they were on and just smells it all the time, you know, in the most rando places. Um, let me go ahead and, you know, manufacture these voices calling out your name. Now we're smart, you know, maybe, maybe we watch those true crime podcasts, you know, or we're really into murder porn, you know, that not real murder porn, calm down like that, that whole true crime (laughs) thing. Um, God, I don't want you to start getting strongly worded emails, Scott. You got to correct my freckled ass. No, that's okay. All right. So. Don't write letters to Scott. That one's my fault. Anyway, if we are, you know, even watching like Law and Order, we know that hearing and seeing and smelling things that aren't there, we are a hop, skip, and a jump away from the tinfoil hat. And, uh, you know, and and we really feel like we're losing it. And sometimes we'll even go to a therapist who doesn't specialize in trauma. And we'll say, you know what? I could have sworn that I hear people calling my voice. They're like, oh, psychotic. Let me put you on some antipsychotic medic. Not a a thing. Again, I say again, PTSD, very normal reaction to a very abnormal set of circumstances. Nightmares. Um, When we're sleeping, we're very vulnerable. Obviously, we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so our brain will, will... do all sorts of things to try to wake us up, to try to get us back into the here and now where we can stay safe. PTSD makes a ton of sense. And and we can explain it to anybody. Or rather, we could explain it to anybody. And um, language is really important to me. And so I really take exception. Um, I'm, I'm about to piss off some of your listeners, probably, Scott. But I do, I really take exception to therapists and mental health professionals who who pretend that this is high math because mental health isn't. We all have mental health. Everybody deals with some sort of depression. We all feel anxious. This is not rocket surgery. This is this is our lived experience. And you know, okay. NCOs do a lot of great hip pocket training. We can do the exact same thing with PTSD, with drug and alcohol abuse, with depression, with OCD, with eating disorders. This is not high math. And PTSD especially is incredibly logical. Doesn't make it comfortable. Right. Doesn't and it's not comfortable. And, and a lot of times the conversations around it are very uncomfortable. You know, when, when, when you start, start talking about it to uh, a therapist or whoever, a spouse or, or something like that. It, it, it's an uncomfortable situation because I, I, in my opinion anyways, is, uh, you know, we, we had this stigma about mental health. And when you start talking about these things, talking about seeing things or hearing things or smelling things, People just are like, well, man, that guy's nuts. You know, he, he's got to be crazy, you know? And, and so you don't really want to admit these things publicly or to, you know, to anybody really, uh, you know, sometimes. And that's, that it's unfortunate that, that it's like that, but you know, we, we sometimes don't want to have these conversations, but I think it is important to have the, the conversations as uncomfortable as they may be. I, I appreciate you saying that Scott. And I think you know, my, my dream fantasy when I was going through this and I, and I hear this a lot in session is, you know what, Virginia, I just really want to do this on my own. You know, I just want to read the book. I kind of want to do this on my own shit. If you could do it on your own, you already would have brother. You would have already figured this out. Yep. We don't heal in isolation. We heal in community. You don't go on an, out on a convoy. You don't Bergdahl it. You don't freaking go out you know, without your fire team, because that doesn't end well. No, it doesn't. And so don't, you know, I, I, I implore your brothers and sisters in arms here. 
if you could all, if you could do this on your own, you already would have, you already would have. And, but here's the fact, you know what? And you talked uh, right at the top about kind of facts and rumors about PTSD. There are a lot of rumors about PTSD that are 100% not true, but absolutely will fuck with your head. And the number one, and, and your belief system, moreover, number one rumor I hear, and, and you touched on this, I want to go back to if that's all right, mm-hmm. um, is this idea that PTSD has no cure. I'll always have PTSD. Every, you know, I'm so glad that, you know, Scott and Virginia could come back from their PTSD, whoop for them, but that's not, that's not my thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll always have PTSD. It'll never go away. And I'm just, I'm screwed. And that belief system is so widely held and so widely propagated within the active duty environment, within the veteran environment, and even within the therapeutic environment, all the facts and rumors that I have in my book are actually things that I've heard from other, you know, masters and PhD level clinicians. I mean, the, this isn't just from, you know, Joe on the street. Uh, and this isn't just private snuffy. This is, you know, Dr. Umpty Chuck as well. And so this is, you know, it's just not true. Now, there are three evidence-based treatments that are approved by the Department of Veteran Affairs for treatment of PTSD. Now, these aren't the only treatments. But so first I want to say, well, first let me tell you what they are. So it's cognitive processing therapy, CP as in PAPA, T is in tango, CPT. Then we've got prolonged exposure therapy. And then we have EMDR, that's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. That is a mouthful. It Thank is a God mouthful. It. Well, if it doesn't have an acronym, it's not real, right? Right. So <laughs> EMDR. So those are the three evidence-based treatments that are approved by the VA, which is significant because the VA is a bureaucratic beast. For them to approve something is you know, oh, hallelujah. Right. To approve anything um, is amazing. Amen, brother. But that means that, so they're pretty ubiquitous. We can find them in pretty much, well, today, today we can find them in pretty much any military treatment facility. Um, you can go online, you do a psychology today search and put in, you know, EMDR therapist, McAllen, Texas, 78501. And poof, you're going to come up with, with, uh, with folks who specialize in that form of, you know, of trauma therapy. Um, you know, those are available. And evidence-based treatments are important, Scott, because they've been proven, to, proven, scientifically proven, to help most people most of the time. So think of this in terms of like the Pareto rule, okay? So if we 80-20 this stuff, and we've got course of action A, um, you know, cognitive processing therapy. It's going to hurt, help, tw- you know, 80% of people. Outlier is going to be 20%. Let's say you're an outlier. If I had a 20% chance of winning the lottery, I'd play. Right. All right. I got it. We know that a certain number of folks who engage in any of the, uh, of the treatments are going to be outliers and it won't work because that's math and that's how numbers work. Got it. Then you go to COA2 you know, or Coa Bravo, then you go to Coa Charlie. Let's say that you do all three of these, you know, VA approved evidence-based treatments for PTSD. Does that mean you're fucked? No, it means one of two things. Either we have the diagnosis wrong, which happens a lot. You know, it is what Mm -hmm. it is. No one's perfect. It it could mean um, that you have something called a co-occurring disorder. So that's, that's a fancy ass term that means um, coming with. So PTSD is one of those disorders that always comes to the party with friends. Super joiner. Woo, party on. So Party animal, it, right? <laughs> right? So in my practice, I see uh, five different disorders that always come to the party with PTSD. So de- um, depression, anxiety, drug or alcohol misuse, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and eating disorders. I say again, eating disorders. And I'm talking to my men out there, and I'm especially talking to you, special word for community infantry folks. You know I'm talking about you. 
We don't talk about it a lot. Eating disorders are very prevalent within the community. Um, there's also could be moral injury. And I devote an entire chapter of the book to it. Moral injury is something that we don't talk a lot about. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, I had already been licensed for several years before I started reading research on it. And, and we'll maybe come back to that. But if you are an outlier, you, you, you might have that co-occurring disorder. We might have a bad diagnosis. Or you might, you might have won the PTSD lottery and have what we call treatment-resistant PTSD. But guess what, folks? We have treatment for treatment-resistant PTSD. It's like having a bad rash. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I don't know what would be worse. Uh, another story for another day. Thinking of that bubble gum, brother. Anyway, <laughs> so we, we there was so much money. Um, thank God, and so much, so much freaking brilliant researchers who are really working on treatment resistant PTSD. And I think especially of the folks, the Department of Defense, if I can brag on some colleagues for a bit, the Department of Defense Center of Excellence for PTSD is in San Antonio, Texas. Woo, go Spurs. And it's the Strong Star Project, strongstar.org. That is a ridiculously long acronym, South Texas mm, Research, PTSD something. Anyway, strongstar.org. And they are doing all of this amazing research for treatment-resistant PTSD. Uh, they're doing things like ketamine, the God shot, the stellate ganglion block, we call it the God shot sometimes, and DMA, um, what we call transdiagnostic therapies, meaning that it takes care of a lot of shit all at once. Um, we're doing all sorts of uh, faith-based therapies that are really working. And um, so if a lot of folks who are listening to this are probably thinking like, oh, so that's nice for Scott and Virginia. But what I would want you to know is that this is for you. This is for you also. Treatment is for you also. Evidence-based treatments are important. I want to just take a minute to talk about why. They're based in science. And I know a lot of people don't like science these days. I get it. But you know, you don't have to believe in gravity either. But this shit is for real. And if you try to sit down and the chair's not there, your ass will hit the floor. These evidence-based treatments work for most people most of the time. And that's science, friends. That is science. But hear this, hear this. Nothing, no thing and no one can change your strongly held belief if you don't want it to. And that's science too. So it is so, what it is. So if you, if you, feel like there there's no hope for you that you you can't change you're just going to be stuck with this forever if you're that's feeling, your your belief then then that's what's i mean it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's like if that's just gonna be what you end up with is that kind of what you're saying it can be yeah you know and i would want to start by saying feelings aren't facts I'm not going to say fuck your feelings because feelings matter. Feelings keep us alive. They're a very, they're a very fundamental part of evolution. You know, feelings keep us alive. You know, feelings, every good thing that's ever happened in the U.S. started because somebody was pretty pissed off. And that's not a bad thing. Right. You know, it, don't, don't have your feelings. You know, and we have to get real that there are a lot of people who are listening to this who believe that treatment just, you know, it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. That, you know, all right, there is, there's, there's no, there's really no nice way to say it. So just put your seatbelt on um, and, and send your strongly worded emails letter later. Um, there are a lot of us who are on the fence and we're not really sure whether we believe treatment is possible, whether we believe change is possible or whether we can actually do that. Right. And, and, and I think that that's a point I was trying to, to get to. Uh, and I, I, I like the way you said it much better than I did, but, but I think the, the key there is that the, the key to being successful in, getting treatment is to kind of change that mindset. And, and that's something that only the person can do, you know, that, that individual can do, you know, if I, if I don't, 
if I don't think that treatment's right for me, well, it's not going to be right for me until I decide that it is right for me. And so I, I need to come to that realization, I think. We do. And I'm not going to bullshit you and pretend it's easy. Right. Um, because, you know, if I had one superpower, Scott, I, you know, I don't want to fly or be invisible. I would want to be able to believe, be, make people believe that change is possible and make them want to change. As a therapist, that would be amazing. There's nothing I can say. There's no book I can write. There's no study I can give you to make you believe that you can do this. And that's okay. It's okay to be on the fence. And what I would want to ask you, if I were your therapist and I were eyeballing you in my office or in my Zoom room, is I would want to ask you, is it possible that you're wrong? Is it possible that you are just dead ass wrong? And, and at the risk, risk of being effective, you know, offensive, you know, fuck you. Is it possible that you are wrong? Have you ever... Have you ever been really challenged by something before and overcome it? Have you ever been in a situation that you thought was insurmountable and you survived it? Is it possible that you're wrong? I'm not asking if you are. I don't need a yes, no. I don't need a definite. I just want to know if it's possible. Right. Because if it's possible that you're wrong, and shit, I don't know about you, but I'm wrong every single day, several times a day. If it is possible that you're wrong, then it's possible that killing yourself might not be the right answer. It's possible, it's possible that you could come back from this. And remind me what the fuck you have to lose, by the way, by engaging in treatment with PTSD or moral injury or depression or an eating disorder, what do you have to lose? And then there's kind of that bigger elephant in the room. And uh, this especially comes with moral injury. There are a lot of us who are listening to this podcast who don't believe that we deserve to recover. That somehow if I reclaim my life, that it dishonors my brother, my battle buddy, that somehow it makes what I did in combat okay, that somehow it makes, it, it, it erases the, the value or rather the, the value judgment that comes with what I did. And it's possible you're wrong about that too. You know it. Yeah. And, and the, the moral injury is an interesting thing. I, I the, the, that phrase is relatively new to me. It's something that I, I only just within the last, uh, you know, maybe year or two, I actually first heard that, that phrase. And it is interesting because you, you may have done like nothing wrong, but you may have seen something that gets done and it, and it, it, it's an injury. It, it, it injures you just like, you know, other, other injuries could. And it's, and it is an incredibly strong uh, thing to deal with, you know, that those moral injuries, um, you know, I, I wrote about those in my book, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I still sometimes have, have trouble dealing with, those types of, uh, the, those types of injuries, just the things that, that occurred, you know, it just was, was a difficult thing. Um, and, and I, I wonder how many people are out there who are struggling with a moral injury and don't even realize it because, you know, maybe they don't meet the criteria of, you know, all of the PTSD symptoms and all, all of that type of stuff. And they, they they just don't know what is going on with them. And, um, you know, it, I think that's, that's an interesting one. Um, the, the, the moral injuries. I, I appreciate that Scott. And, um, with your permission, I'd like to just kind of get down to brass tacks because there might be a lot of people who are listening to, to this podcast. who have never heard that term moral injury. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
So PTSD is pretty well known. So that is a, a trauma reaction. It's our brain and body's very natural reaction to threat to trauma. So our brain will go through incredible acrobatics in order to keep us safe. And those are those PTSD symptoms. So moral injury really has to do more with the should. Um, it's really rooted in shame. So it stems in what we believe, I say again, what we believe we should have done, what we should have known, how things should have been in war, in life, in combat. Um, there are a lot of things that happen. Um, there are a lot of things that happen downrange. And the further you are away from the flagpole, the more likely it happens. It's just, it is what it is. And research on moral injury it puts these in, in three. And this is, uh, this is not my research, by the way. I want to give mad props to Brett Litz and his team um, out of Boston University. Brilliant guy, great researcher. Um, I remember the first time that I read, <coughs> pardon me, his um, his book called Adaptive Disclosure. Um, I remember thinking that it felt like he had he was sitting, you know, around a campfire, getting pissed drunk with a bunch of us and just taking really excellent notes. And I thought to myself, how is it that no one's talking about this? And Litz and his team put this into three categories. So combat loss, perpetration, and leadership betrayal. And, and I want to flesh those out just a little bit. So combat loss. Um, and, and I don't ever want to feel like I'm lecturing you on this um, because, fuck, you, yeah, your book really covers this in, in heartbreaking and very poignant way. So in, in war, we lose people downrange um, and we lose people to suicide after. And at this point, unfortunately, I don't know many of us who have lost more people to combat than we have to suicide. You know, we've, we've all lost a lot of battle bodies to suicide at this point. Um, when combat loss happens, it's especially hurtful because because the mission goes on. Not all of us have an experience like yours, thank God, where we find out about combat loss. We find out about the death of someone we love so much. And then we're taking enemy fire, like literally in the next beat. But, you know, there is something very, very hard about that. And, you know, we use these words like sacrifice and hero. And, you know, it, it really, it can feel very empty. And, you know, and I especially think, I mean, I joined in 97, I'm a lot older than you, but, you know, I think about those, you know, those post 9-11 uh, enlistees, you know, there was something really pure and honorable, you know, we all wanted to, to bring the fight there and to, you know, to bring, bring a battle buddy, bring our buddies home and, you know, uphold the Geneva Conventions, the rule of law and, you know, things happen in war that are just not simple or pure. And combat loss is especially hard because there, it, there's just, it's, an, it's incongruous. You know, this idea of losing somebody so dear to us and then the aftermath. And then perpetration, um, you know, get, get your emails out. So this is, this is war crimes, uh, but not just war crimes. I, I you know, in my private practice, I work with people for the most part who have either witnessed or committed war crimes. And that can, you know, that's a really big umbrella. And we need to stop pretending that that's not a thing. It's a really big umbrella. Um, it happens across gender and gender identity services, MOSs. Let's, I mean, shit, we, you know, there's even that word fragging uh, that we all giggle at in the field. Um, you know, that that's perpetration that would fall under this. But um, yeah, a lot of things happen downrange that are not OK. Um, and then we have leadership betrayal. And, you know, this is a, this is a special type of fuckery um, because everybody makes mistakes. OK, I, I'm shit. I make mistakes every day and leaders make mistakes every day. 
But leadership betrayal is is a special class of fuckery because these are this is betrayal that is especially capricious and intentional. Um, and it always seems to be a major. I, t- I don't keep keep your emails to yourself, field grades. But um, you know, it, it's that. You know, it, it's that major who wants to keep going outside the wire to meet with the locals so they can get their combat action badge right. or, you know, or their CIB, right? Or, it, you know, it's, you know, somebody who is bullying someone until they commit suicide or, yeah, and this happens, you know, or, or, you know, rape, sexual assault, um, these are things that are happening downrange and male on male sexual assault happens a lot. We don't talk about it a lot, but it happens a lot. And oftentimes leaders know about it, um, really excessive hazing it, getting uh, swept under the rug. Uh, Jennifer Freyd, uh, Dr. Freyd uh, is out of the University of Oregon, and she writes about a similar topic, similar, not same Um Oh, gosh, am I going to blank on on her stuff right now? Institutional betrayal um, that was actually covered on South Park. She's South Park famous. And wow. She's badass. She's so such a good researcher and just advocate and awesome human being. And, um, you know, she she talks about the Darvo model um, with, with sexual assault. So this is the idea, you know, especially um, with uh uh, with university programs where someone will be sexually assaulted and then it gets kind of swept under the rug because. And uh, there was a lot of really healthy discussion about that in, in the Me Too movement. But anyway, her, her work on uh, institutional betrayal is sort of analogous to um, this leadership uh, betrayal. But those are those three kind of broader categories of moral injury. And, um, and they're heavy. And they're heavy. And uh, a lot of times in therapy, and, and I'm a therapist, so I, I will totally badmouth all of us, but we, we don't, I don't like, I'll just speak for myself. I, you know, we're not, we're not chaplains. And we are talking about deep soul wounding, if we're being real. And if the idea of a, soul, a wounded soul is a little too like woo woo or touchy feely for you, I think it might help to think about this as an all out existential crisis. A no shit, come to Jesus, what the fuck happened moment that alters our belief system about ourselves, especially about ourselves, about other people in the world, but really about ourselves. And we see a lot of really self-destructive behavior that comes with moral injury. Um, You know, and and when I'm talking self-destructive, I'm not talking about you know, drinking too much. I'm talking about um, riding your motorcycle without a helmet while high on coke to go get your daughter from daycare type risk behavior. Right. Your story. One of, I can't make this shit up. Um, this is the type of high risk behavior that we engage in that self-punishing behavior. Because with moral injury, we, we can't just process the trauma. You know, so you, we, you and I, you know, in the pre-show, we were talking about cognitive processing therapy. What an amazing tool for people who are very analytic to take something as nebulous and ugly and, and just hard to wrap around, wrap your head around as a feeling and to put it into the emotional equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet, to be able to right size and, and make things, you know, hit auto sum and make it make sense. But when, when it comes that and that's perfect for PTSD, but when it comes to moral injury, we have to process the trauma and its meaning. I say again, we need to process the trauma and its meaning because we start asking ourselves these questions, you know, what type of person would let this happen? Right. What type of person would allow this what type of, you know, I, I was in this, an interrogation mission or, you know, and there's a lot that falls under this umbrella. And you know? I, I talk about a, a situation in, in my book where I'm faced with the decision whether or not I, I should kill a child. The um, wooden gun. I, that I, wooden gun I, that, I that, this, that, that that kid was holding and, 
And from a distance, it looked like he was holding an AK-47. And so I raised my rifle to shoot him. And the kid was 10 or 11 years old, however old he was. And I was, I was like just a trigger pull away. The safety was off. I was aiming at him. It was close enough. It was an easy shot. I probably would have killed him that day had I not realized that he was just holding a wooden gun. And in earlier, prior to that moment, and all of that happened in a blink of an eye, you know, that it was, it was just as, as quick as raising your rifle and, and getting ready to shoot. I mean, it, it's really that quick. Um, but prior to that moment, I, I thought of myself as the type of person who would literally do anything to protect a child. And then here I am standing with a rifle pointed at a kid ready to, to blow his brains out. And, and like that in a blink of an eye, who I, I saw myself as completely changed. And, you know, you know, talking about, you know, being, being injured, you know, with a moral injury, like in, in this, you know, it's kind of self, uh, you know, blaming myself for, for different things and, and everything like it, it's just, it just like hit me hard. And, and it, it still is something that I, I, I struggle with from time to time. Um, you know, and it, it's just a, a difficult situation. Absolutely. And we do have ways to right size that. Um, and when I say right size that, I mean to process it and to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we don't talk a lot about this sort of stuff. And I think that we're failing, we're failing troops that we don't, you know, we're not talking about, you know, unintentional or intentional killing of non-combatants. We don't talk about torture or sadistic acts or aggression or sexual assault. Um, we're not, we don't talk about it and it's not because it doesn't happen. I get it, you know, and, and talking about that, it might not be smart a lot of the time, especially if we can still be prosecuted for it. Um, and, and I talk about a lot about this in the book, because, uh, if we're still on active duty and we need to process this, but we signed a non-disclosure agreement, or we made a, a pact with our team which happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, st we, there, there still are ways that we can process this. And, uh, you know, in my practice, I use adaptive disclosure. Um, that's by Brett Litz, who I, I talked about earlier. Um, and it's a one session add on to uh, prolonged exposure therapy. Um, and it's, it's super woo woo, you know, it, but it works. It works. Um, and I, I describe it at length in the book so you can get wooed out there. Um, and I don't need to sound crazy on your show, Scott. Um, you know, we, we do use, um, oh goodness, what, what is the name of that? Uh, Transdiagnostic. I, it, it'll come to me later. Um, actually, I should probably have it right here. But, um, but there are other, what the hell is it? My gone age happens. Watch out. It'll happen to you too. Um, but that, you know, there are ways that we can, you know, evidence-based treatments, evidence-based treatments, you know, meaning that we have, we have tested them, you know, using a, a scientific method, we've tested them on, you know, over the course of years, uh, on literally thousands of participants. Think about like how the FDA, uh, tests drugs, um, you know, double blind studies over the course of, in some cases, decades. So we know that these evidence-based treatments work. And, you know, the idea of processing moral injury, and especially when it comes to something we've done personally that we're not so proud of, the point is not to make it okay. Like, oh yeah, I processed it. Yeah, I'm forgiven. I'm okay. Um, it's to look at it from a more objective third person perspective. And I know that's, that might sound really woo woo and kind of fucked up, like mm, for real, but when it comes to, when it comes to moral injury, when it comes to our own heads and when it comes to PTSD, we are literally not in our right minds a lot of the time. And it's, it's quite possible that we are not seeing ourselves objectively. Uh, you know, one thing I often say to clients and even to friends, you know, I hear, I hear folks beating up on themselves. I say, shit, if, would you, 
what would you do if somebody came up, you know, said that to your kid, what you're saying to yourself, oh, I get so mad. What if somebody else come and say that to you? Oh, I get so mad. So why are you saying it to yourself? <laughs> Knock it off. Right. Like that is not okay. Like, no, I mean, who there, you know, we can beat ourselves up better than anyone, but it's not necessarily true. Maybe you're not a war criminal. Maybe you're just an asshole. Um, right. that, that's a possibility. Oh, I mean, and, and there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> <laughs> I've reached that conclusion many a time with clients. Um, and that's not to be mean. Um, it is what it is. We, you know, there's a lot of things that we do. And, and Dave Grossman's book, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman um, wrote On Killing, which is, um, is a classic for a reason. Um, there is a lot, probably wouldn't surprise you to know that somebody like me designed army training, not, not an NCO. There is a lot, you know, we have been training soldiers the same way for millennia. You know, the idea of we're going to break you down to build you up. The idea of group punishment, you know, mm -hmm. if, if we're in formation together and my boots untied, no one's going to come up to me like, hey, Virginia, you know, your boots untied. How does that make you feel? No, no. We're all going to be doing pushups together because what have we learned from this situation is we all have to look out for each other. It's training. So we want to train. We want to instill that idea of good order and discipline into soldiers, into Marines, into even Coasties and airmen. <laughs> no, I'm done fucking with you. Don't write me an email. Don't write me an email. But we, we do. We want to instill that good order and discipline. The reason's super simple. If I'm, if I'm your commander and I, and I hand you a spoon, I say, Scott, I need you to take that hill. Here's a spoon. Here's your weapon. I don't need you to look at me and say, um, you know, ma'am, uh, I don't know if you were aware that this is a spoon. I need you to go, no shit. Oh, I need you to charge with that spoon. I need you to go all Braveheart for me because that's what I need. And right. so we explain that, you know, that's part of our training. It's just so, it, it's beautiful. But then outside of that environment, let's say that there is somebody who um, is having problems with DUI. You know, it, it gets a DUI because they have some, they're having problems with their PTSD and, you know, PTSD and alcohol abuse, like fucked up peas and carrots. They come together all the time. And so maybe they get a DUI and uh, the fish rots from the head. We see, you know, we'll, we'll see folks, you know, out on base, uh, you know, we'll, what, what, what we do, we punish them. We give them extra duty. We remand them to barracks. And then all of a sudden you've got, maybe an E5 or an E6, and they're getting shit on by PFC. And you're like, really? But remember, it's that group punishment. It's how we're trained. It's how we're trained. It's, it's, there's no ill intent behind it. It just is what it is. And so, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into the making of a soldier, the making of a Marine and, and on combat, it does a really good job explaining that. And I would really, re I recommend it a lot for my folks who are dealing with moral injury. I would certainly recommend it to your listeners. Excellent. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a good way to kind of, kind of wrap up the uh, moral injury sure. piece of that. I think that, 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 that does, uh, we, we've done that uh, a lot of justice, but I, I think you go into, uh, you know, some, some stuff with moral injury into the, in the book. And, and it, and it makes a lot of sense the, the way you outline it and, and, and put it out there. So I, anyone who, you know, any of this stuff has resonated with, I, I really encourage you to go get the book and, and take a look at it because, you know, there's, there's more information in the book and it, it's, it's laid out in a really uh, clear manner. And it, and it really does make sense. Um, you, you described something else in the book. Um, that I, I wanted to touch on a little bit too, um, about how people who are dealing with PTSD can cope by uh, tuning out those negative emotions that they're feeling, and 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 you talk about it kind of like your your emotions if you if you're to draw out like a uh, 
like a timeline almost where, where you have like the negative uh, stuff on, on one side and you have the positive stuff on the other side. So you have like the sadness and depression and all, all this stuff over, over on one side. And then you have happiness and joy and, and, and all that stuff on, on the other side. Um, but you talk about how, you know, when people are, are suffering from uh, PTSD, they, they sort of learn to block off some of the negative things. But it's not a good thing because it has the, the equal or opposite effect of also blocking out the positive emotions. And, and so it kind of shrinks that timeline in. And so that all that the person is feeling is just the stuff in the middle, the kind of myth, like blah feelings. And, and it's, it was very interesting for me to, to see that and, and hear like why that happens and, and how that, that that's just a thing that does happen. Because I noticed that in myself where, you know, I, I was trying to just suppress some of the, the negative, the, the bad things that were, were going on in my head. But then at the same time, I just, I wasn't feeling joy or happiness either. In, in, in my own life and with things that I ordinarily would have been extremely happy about or, you know, extremely, you know, you know, uh, positive emotions would, would have been flowing, you know, during some of these things. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't find it in me to be happy about certain things, you know, when, uh, you know, when you, you go to a, a sporting event and, and the home team, you know, uh, like a baseball game, the home team hits a home run, you know, everyone stands up and they're cheering. And, you know, I, I, I was the type of person who would just be kind of like sitting there like, ah, well, oh, good for him. You know, like, you know, it, it, I recognize it as a good thing, but it just didn't really turn me on. It didn't really do much for me. And, and it was very interesting, you know, how you describe how, how by bringing in the, the negatives closer to the middle, it, it's also bringing in the positives closer to the middle. And then all that you, that you feel is just that middle ground. And that, that, that was very interesting to me. Uh, would, would you be able to kind of dig into that just a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I had a friend who, who used to always say, you know, if you're already in over your head, does it really matter how much deeper you go in the ocean? <laughs> and so I say that as a trigger warning, because this is super uncomfortable. Yeah. Super uncomfortable. But if we can't talk about it here, you know, what are we doing? So this has to do with Criterion Charlie of, uh, of PTSD. It's avoidance. And avoidance within the context of PTSD, it's so logical. It is so logical, most logical illness there is. So that avoidance, we will go way, way way out of our way to avoid anything that reminds us of our trauma. So we will avoid people, places, things, conversations, social media, you name it, we will avoid it. And um, since we're already talking about an uncomfortable subject, let's just go there. When when we have PTSD, um, we know we're not okay. We may not know what's going on, but we know we're not okay. And our family knows that we're not okay. And we know they know we're not okay. And they know, we know they know we're not okay. And so we start to avoid our family members because we don't want to worry them. They're worried. And they don't want to talk about it because they, it, you know, maybe they've, they've went to Dr. Google and they're like, oh shit, you know, well, I don't, I don't want Scott to schwack himself. So I'm not going to ask. And it becomes this big festering elephant in the room. Now that's a metaphor. There's no actual, me- no, no real elephant, but it becomes as big and nasty and festering as an elephant in the room. It's there. Everyone knows it's there and no one talks about it. And so when it comes to avoidance, we start pushing away, I say again, pushing away the people who can support us the most. We show up pissed drunk to our family reunion. We blow up our perfectly good marriage. We stop hanging out with our friends. We pick fights on the Facebook or whatever. Social media is cool these days. You know, we will start just blowing shit up. And a big part of that is is avoidance. We will start to avoid. And avoidance makes a lot of sense within the context of PTSD because who wants to feel shitty? Right. 
dumb. It, 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 it does. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, like you said, who, who does want to feel bad? And if, if you don't have any of these good, meaningful relationships, then you can't be hurt Blow by them up. either. You know, you can't, you can't yes, screw it sir. up and, and, and ruin it. So, you know, just avoid them. You know, it does make sense. I'm not saying it's yeah. the right thing to do for the listeners. I'm just, I'm just saying it does but make it sense. Makes, it makes sense. It's very, very logical. And by the way, in the book, we do talk about how to reclaim our relationships. You absolutely can unfuck your relationships. Um, and and we, have, we go through how, I promise. If I can do it, anybody can. But when we think about feelings, we think about them on a continuum. So that's that, that timeline that you were talking about. So this continuum. So feelings, it, it, this, you know, and this is just, this is my example. I think it, it's probably the easiest way I can explain neuroscience in, in a snap. So think about, you know, feelings on a continuum. On this side of the continuum, we have all the shitty feelings I don't want to feel. So I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to feel angry. I don't want to feel, um, I don't want to feel upset. And then we go through and you've got those middle feelings. I, I, you know, meh, I feel ambivalent. I feel, you know, okay. Then over here, I've got those feelings I want to feel. I feel happy and joy and sprinkles and rainbows and shit. And so the idea is that I want to avoid all the bad feelings on this side of the continuum. I just want to feel middle feelings and good feelings. And if that were a thing, it would be awesome. But that's not how the brain works. So there are these kind of these unintended second and third order effects that happen. So when we start trying to avoid the feelings on this side, what happens is things on a continuum attenuate on both ends in equal measure. So think of it like an accordion. So if I start to avoid these feelings on this side, all the bad feelings, what happens is this comes in in the same amount. All of a sudden, I can't feel. I say again, I can't feel all of the feelings on the right side. So I'm not able to feel joy and laughter and happiness and sprinkles. And I get into this middle space called numb. Numb. I just don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. And if we're being for real, that is fucking terrifying. Because we know cognitively in our minds, we know I should feel something. My spouse comes up to me, my kid comes up to me, and they are legit upset. And we, I know that they should be upset. They have every right to be about, I don't feel anything. Even worse, maybe I feel annoyed. Maybe I say to myself, just quit your crying, you fucking baby. And then, then I think to myself, what my kid is for? Did I really just think and say that? Only, you know, and then it, it feeds into this idea because only a monster would do that. I don't feel anything. Maybe I start Googling it and I start wondering if I'm a psychopath or a sociopath. And newsflash, if you're asking, you're not. So that's, that's a good thing. If you're not asking, go see a therapist. But if you're asking, you're definitely not, definitely not. But this numb feeling is really terrifying. And then a lot of times what will happen when we're in this numb phase, we don't feel anything, is we get an idea. And I think, you know, fuck it, I'll just commit suicide. Then I feel something. I feel something. I don't feel good. I don't feel bad, but I feel something. And if you've been going through a period of numbness for a very long time, that's new, surprising, and good. It doesn't matter that, that most suicide attempts don't end well. Just talk to an EMT. Go have a... Go have, a deep conversation with an EMT, that does not end well. That does not end well. But we feel something. And we tell ourselves, well, it's got to be good if I feel something. Because that's better than feeling nothing. That makes me more normal. So I feel something. So then maybe I start thinking about it. I start ruminating about suicide. I just start thinking about it. Because I tell myself, well, I'm not going to do it, but it makes me feel better. And I also tell myself, oh, I'm just thinking about it just thinking about it. And um, here's the thing about coping mechanisms. They work until they don't. We need to get very real about that. Drinking and drugs are awesome because they work until they don't. 
if I can get rid of, of all of my, you know, if my solution is a swallow away, that's a lot easier than eight to 12 weeks of therapy. I got it. It's why we see that together so much. So I tell myself that I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just thinking about it. Maybe I'm thinking about um, who, who do I think is going to show up to my funeral, to my memorial service? Um, how am I going to do it? Um, what am I going to write as my last fuck you post on the Facebook, um, which was my personal favorite thing to ruminate about. So I'm not, not throwing anything out there. Um, we just start thinking about it and it feels good. It feels good because I have a coping mechanism. I have something else to think about. So here's the problem with coping mechanisms. They work until they don't. And like it or not, friends, we all get to a point where our ability to cope is overwhelmed by our circumstances. I say again, our ability to cope is overwhelmed by our circumstances. That is called life. And that is, that's going to happen. And when we are ruminating, when we're thinking about suicide as a solution, that's our go-to. It happens so fast. It happens so fast. In the last years, I have uh, I've had a lot of really cool jobs and um, and a lot of not really cool jobs. And one of the one of the jobs I think that taught me the most is uh, I worked on, on a military base where I responded to uh, units where there was maybe a murder suicide or a suicide within the ranks. And I've also worked in the jail system where. Uh, where folks who try to commit suicide and it doesn't work end up. And so I want to kind of start there because I want to, I want to walk the dog. I want, so this is, this is kind of what happens. So when I am visiting, visiting folks in, in jail, <clears throat> first of all, you're wearing, I don't know if you've ever been to jail, but they're cold. Yeah. Jail is cold, depending on, well, not, not if you're in South Texas like me, but in most places, jail is really cold. I mean, they keep it very, very cold. And um, you end up in something called a turtle suit. And I don't know what the real name for it. And I'm not trying to be pejorative. And you know, no offense to all turtles out there. But, um, you know, so it's a one piece green smock um, that it has so much stitching in it. Uh, that it's not able to be pulled. So there's no suicide risk. So all of your clothes are removed. Uh, you know, all of your items are removed. You put in a turtle suit and you put in a really cold cell. And then you got to talk to somebody like me. Shitty day, shitty day. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. And I can, it's almost the same every single time. Virginia, it happened so fast happened so fast before I knew it, fill in the blank, before I knew it, the bottle of pills was gone and so was half the bit. Before I knew it, I had the gun in my mouth. Before I knew it, my child walk in, walked in on me while I was tying the noose. Before I knew it, the SWAT team showed up and I had red dots on my chest. Before I knew it, this shit happens fast. This shit happens fast. and so. Real talk here. I need you, your listeners, your viewers to know that when we are using thinking about suicide as a coping mechanism, we are on a razor's edge. We're a lot closer than we think. And it is time to get help. It's time to get help. Well, let's flip to the other end on kind of the, you know, visiting these units, especially. And, um, and sometimes family members, but mostly for me, the experience has been with military units. The one thing I hear eh, almost every single time is, you know, uh, I thought I, I knew Scott had gone through some shit. I knew things were bad, but it seemed like he was getting better. You know, he came yeah. to the office Christmas party. I saw him smiling. You know, he was looking, I thought, I thought he had turned things around. And then when we go back to that suicide as a coping mechanism, it makes a lot of sense because we're thinking, you know, we, we have a solution now where we didn't have one before. And so we do kind of externalize that. You know, we do start, you know, giving our things away and being nicer to people because we have a solution. 
in our mind. It's a forever solution. Um, and, and that is the thing that I hear over and over and over again is, you know, I, I thought everything was turning around. If suicide happens really quickly, and it almost always happens when we're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, almost always. Um, and when we are feeling suicidal, we have to be real. We are literally, literally not in our right minds. And I mean, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself. When I was suicidal, you know, I was thinking about suicide all the time and it made me feel better. You know, and I was asking myself things like, oh, will my life insurance pay out if I commit suicide? I even told myself that it would be better. Now, this, this goes to the heart of selfless service. This, this, this goes right into army values, that my unit would be better off if I were gone, that my husband would be better off if I were gone. Maybe he could find a really nice lady and have babies or something. Um, I really told myself that it would be better for my family for my loved ones, if I was out of the picture. And that's, that's some truth there. But here's the thing about love. It is stubborn as fuck. Love is unbelievably stubborn. Even if you've already signed the divorce papers, even if you've already, you know, showed a piss drunk at your family reunion, even if you've already told off your ex and, uh, and your kids aren't talking to you, there, that might not be the end. You might, you might could be wrong. You might could be wrong. When, when we're in that really numb phase, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. And what I need your listeners to understand is that, oh, and this is going to hurt to hear. This even feels gross to say it's normal. And when I say that something's normal within the context of PTSD, that doesn't mean it feels good. It feels like dog shit. And it's really frightening, but it is a very normal trauma reaction. It is normal. It doesn't mean you're going crazy. It doesn't mean you're hopeless. It doesn't mean suicide's the right answer. It means that you have a problem and there is a solution. We have those evidence-based treatments. You can ask for them by name. You know, you, you can, there is a way back. And so evidence-based treatments, I, I didn't mention this before, and I'm remiss, eight to 12 sessions, 15 on a high. So that means if you're meeting with, let's say you've been dealing with your PTSD symptoms for five months or 50 fucking years, if you're still seeing Charlie in the foxhole from Nam, and a lot of people are, especially with the fall of Afghanistan, you know, we're getting a lot of folks coming into therapy, whether it's been five months or 50 years. What we know about evidence-based treatments is that they literally take eight on the low end to 15 sessions on the high end to see a significant, a statistically significant reduction in symptoms. If you're going to intensive therapy three days a week, literally in three to four weeks, you will never be the same in a good way. In a good way. And I get that nobody wants to I, I, you know, my thought of therapy before I became a therapist was very Freudian. It was the idea of lying on the couch and talking about my mother. And right. if you want to talk about your daddy issues, I mean, do it, do it, you know, do it to it. I'm not going to hate all of my psychoanalytic friends there. But what I would want you to know about those evidence-based treatments is they're very specific. They're very directed. They're, the only way out is through. The only way out of that valley is through. And therapists are trained, a, a trained trauma therapist can walk with you. And there are a lot of ways that you can find those three evidence-based treatments, that you can get that help. You can ask for them by name. They work and they work quickly. Now they don't tickle. I want to be honest and for real. And you can speak to this because you did co cognitive processing therapy. I can, that's a bucket of suck. But it's it not forever. Here's your straw. Suck it up. It is not forever. And it's not harder. I say again, it is not harder than what you've already been through. I, I'm reading your book right now. 
um, surviving son. And there is nothing harder. There's nothing harder than what you have personally already been through. And the same goes with your listeners. There, there is nothing harder than that. The, these evidence-based treatments, they don't tickle, but they're not forever. You absolutely can do this. You need support. And, you know, in the book, we, we go at a great length to talk about how do we get support? How do we make friends? How, which is right. so and, not easy. And, and you, you talked about this earlier uh, in, in the episode where, you know, for, for women, it's easier. They, they go up and, you know, they can just, you know, oh, I, I like your, you know, your hair. I like your, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden they're chatting their, their best friends and they, they go on and, you know, whatever, but guys like that, that they don't do that. Like we, we just don't talk to each other that way. And it's, it's really hard to do that. Um, you know, the, the other day, um, and I, I was thinking about that because I, I had just finished listening to your, uh, to your book. And I, um, I was thinking about the difference between men and women. My wife goes out to a park with the kids and she comes home with three new friends. And it's like, where the hell did this come from? And, and it, it's just, it's just bizarre. And, um, you know, so I was thinking about this and I was out on a run one morning, um, last week actually. And, uh, I, I stopped at, there's this little like kind of exercise station. They have like a pull-up bar and all, all that kind of stuff. And, and so I stopped there and I, I was doing the, the pull-ups and everything else. And a couple of guys, like they stopped and they were on a run, uh, together and they they, uh, they stopped to exercise at the same place and they're like, you want to join us on, on, on our run. We're, we're training for a Spartan race or, or whatever. And, and, uh, you want to join us on the run. And I thought about what you had written about. And I was like, I was trying to figure out, you know, where are these places? Where do you go? And then, then these people just like showed up and it was like, where the hell did this come from? You know, but, but I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll join you on the run. And then, you know, we, we ran around for a little bit and we got to know each other and, you know, it, and it was, you know, a good way to, to, to get to know some new people, um, you know, who lived in the neighborhood. I just never crossed paths with them before, but now, you know, we exchange numbers and now we're, we kind of hang out every, you know, every once in a while. And, and so it, that's a cool, uh, cool way to, to, to get in touch with new people. Um, but it, it's a hard thing to do like that, that just happened to happen to me. And, and it wasn't like a planned thing. It wasn't like I had an event I was going to like, okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to go meet new people or, or whatever. And so it, it was, it was different, you know, a much different experience for me. Um, you know, like I said, my wife comes home with friends all the time and I, I can't keep track track of them all but you know for me it was just like this out of the blue situation and, and so you know for guys it is a lot harder yeah we talk about that a lot in the book and um because you know we think about friends in terms of you know these these are my you know my ride or die friends right you know or their acquaintances and there's really nothing in between and what we need for social support is we need those in-between friends. And that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a term I stole from my cousin, Mark Jackson. I just lifted it off of him because it's brilliant. This idea of in-between friends. Like they're not my ride or die, but they're also not just, you know, a guy. And the way that we find in-between friends, I mean, you lucked out. Legit. That was pretty yeah. cool. But- yeah. For those of us who are not as charismatic as you, (laughs) the the way that we find in between friends is we have to go to places where other people are also looking for in between friends. And thankfully, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of places. So we're looking for activities or events where people go by themselves. In other words, it's not a group or a couple or anything like that. You're specifically going to an event where other people are looking for to have in between friends, um, there's an activity involved because there's nothing worse than being like, well, tell me about yourself. It's like, oh boy, you got yeah. an activity. We're running, we're doing a Spartan race. Do you want to run? Cuts out all the small talk because you're trying it to did. breathe, or at least yeah, I would. And, 
<laughs> yeah, and and you're 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 breathing heavy. You're not in you're not in it for this deep conversation, you know, with with anybody because everyone's sucking and they they they're, they're having a hard time breathing while while they're talking at the same time. So it's a quick, you know, two sent sentence uh, or two word uh, sentence, and 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 that's all you're going to get out of someone. You know, legit. Everyone's sucking wind. Right. Um, you know, and yeah, there's an activity and. If you keep going to it, you build community. The idea is to build community. So if you don't go, um, someone will call and check in on you. Yeah. And that's what we call social support. That's that's big psychobabble talk for friends. And social support is, you know, we have we have meetup groups now. You can go to the meetup app. And, you know, once the pandemic's over, we'll all be meeting up again. Um, church groups. Um, if you're not churchy, you can go to meetup groups for agnostics or atheists, um, book clubs, uh, Spartan running race groups, running groups, um, uh, meetups at museums, 12 step support groups, you know, AA, NA, Al Anon, uh, for family members, ACOA, adult children of alcoholics. Um, CODA, Codependence Anonymous, um, Solos, uh, Survivors of Loved One Suicide. There are incredibly powerful support groups out there that, it, that really provide a lot of support and a lot of help. And the idea is you're going to make a lot of in-between friends. And we've got, listen, listen, listen. We have a whole chapter about it in the book. So we got ideas for days because I've had to go through this myself. Um, you know, my husband's still active due to him. We move every 10 minutes. So like it or not, it is what it is. And so we have, to, you know, you got to get in where you fit in. And so, you know, the idea is we're going to make a lot of in-between friends. And then we're going to have that accountability. If you don't show up, you know, for, you know, your Bunko group, ladies Bunko group, you know, Mabel's going to call me like, Virginia, where, where are you? And we need people to check on us, especially when we're struggling. And, um, or, you know, if you don't show up to a meeting, an AA meeting, your sponsor's going to be like, "Mm, girl, get your ass to a meeting. At least my sponsor does. You know, it's important. It is important to have that accountability. And for every 10 in between friends you make, you might make one ride or die friend. And that's awesome. We deserve people who are in our lives, who are all in, who, who really care about us. And guess what? They deserve us too. They're there because they need us as much as we need them. It's not a one-way street. And I know, I know. And this goes back to that criterion, Charlie, avoidance. I know that I know that I know that if I could do this on my own, I would so rather. I know the idea of making friends is like, really? Like, no, 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 I just want to be left alone. You know, I just want to unibomber it. I want to go, you know, be on my mountain. I want to do my thing. But guess what? The over the data are overwhelmingly clear. The key to lasting recovery is social support. I say again, the key to lasting recovery, social support. So if you're serious about staying recovered from your PTSD, you don't get a choice, right? You need to start making friends. If we don't, we don't recover in isolation. We recover in community. And I think, I, I think that is incredibly important and you're right. It is incredibly difficult, uh, to, to do, but it's incredibly important to do. Uh, at the same time. Yeah, no choice. If no, you want to exactly. relapse, don't do it. Right. And and who wants to go back to that? You know, and one, once when you've gone through all of that hard work to get out of that 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 space for the, the eight to 15 weeks, mm-hmm. um, after, after you went through all that, why, why would you want to go back and have to go through all of that again? You know, so if the worst thing that comes out of this is you make some new friends. Like, is it really that bad? You know? So, um, well with that, I, I think we have, uh, we've definitely given the, the listeners a lot to, uh, consider and 
you know, we've covered a lot about this book uh, on on this show um, more than I I thought we would actually, but but I'm glad that we we got into uh, all of that. But there is so much more in the book, and so if if any piece of this has resonated with any of the listeners, uh, I really do encourage you to go out and get a copy of this book. Um, it's available. Uh, on Amazon and Kindle paperback and, and uh, audio uh, format. So, um, you know, however you like to consume your, your books, you, you can, you can get whatever way you, you prefer. Um, is there, there anywhere else uh, that people can go to uh, uh, follow what you do, uh, get more information? Um, you know, uh, and you, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, about the, um, the, the, first two chapters that you were, you're going to be uh, given away uh, to, to the listeners. Uh, could you say again, where, where they can go to find that? Yeah, my pleasure. You can go to the soldiers um, You can give us your email. We'll sign you up for our newsletter and we'll send you um, a free preview copy of the book. It's got the first two chapters. So we go line by line through, through the criteria um, also, once you sign up with our newsletter, you can get a free copy of our workbook. Uh, so th- that's really great for your CMP exam, so your compensation and pension exam. Um, I recommend uh, having the workbook um, and filling that out to really, I think it's really imperative that we understand our symptoms better than anyone else. And unfortunately, this includes therapists, this includes our doctors, our you know, our chain of command, we have to know our, we have to know this disorder, we have to know it inside out. So we do have that workbook available. Uh, We're available pretty much anywhere books are sold uh, online. We've got the audio book and Kelly Taker is fantastic. You can get a hold of us. Um, We have a Twitter, we have a Facebook page, and we've got a really cool interactive group. And I want to give a mad shout out to my team. So we've got this team of true believers who are just so flipping awesome. Uh, Katie Salaitis, Nicole Trippett, and Barbie McRae, who are just absolutely amazing and are thankfully much younger than me and know how like technology works and, and are just really, they're just awesome women anyway. Also, uh, in 2022, we're going to be putting the, the book out in Spanish. Oh, excellent. Um, that's really important to us because, because access matters. Um, unfortunately, there is a dearth of information. There's just nothing out there in Spanish for mental health. And that's not okay. That is not okay because a lot of service members and veterans speak Spanish and so do their family members. And they, they deserve to recover from PTSD too. Uh, we're also putting out, Katie Salidas is co-authoring The Woman's Guide uh, to PTSD, and that will be much more civilian focused, and that'll be coming out in 2022 as well. So uh, sign up for the newsletter, hang out with us on the, uh, on the Facebook and the Twitter and, uh, and the social media, and, and definitely check out the soldiersguide.com and get your free uh, review copy. We, we really love hearing from from readers and listeners, and we'd love to hear from you. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm remiss. Uh, Also in 2022, we are putting out a uh, a guide, Soldier's Guide to PTSD, specifically for Vietnam veterans. Um, We, yeah, you know, that was, that was, you know, it was a real blind spot of mine. Um, I, and that's, that's on me. That's 100% on me. Um, I had a lot of readers get back to me and they said, you know, I'm a Vietnam era vet. And I, I'm picking up what you're putting down, but it's not in the language I need. And um, so I've been working with a, a couple of uh, peer support groups out in Michigan, of all places. I've never even visited. It just sounds really cold. And, um, and they are helping me um, to, um, to just make it, you know, man, our Vietnam vets just really had it different. It was a very different war. And they made it so that when we came home, when we redeployed, we were really supported. It's unimaginable to me, the idea of having protesters at the airport and being spit on or called a baby killer. Um, and it's, it really is our Vietnam vets who made sure 
that that didn't happen to us. And um, that's deeply moving to me. And, uh, and we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, my dad was a Vietnam vet. He died in 2019. And, you know, he never talked about his experience ever. And, okay. um, and you know what? It's, if I have an opportunity to, to pay that forward, I, I want to. And so we'll be, that'll be coming out in the new year. Well, that's, that's excellent. And it seems like you have a lot of great resources that are available. So anyone who is, uh, who's listening to this and who has struggled with, uh, PTSD, if any of this stuff has resonated with you, uh, reach out, go to the soldiers uh, get the soldier's guide to PTSD. Um, it's like Virginia said, it's available anywhere. Um, and and don't do it alone. You know, go go and find someone who can who can help you. Uh, you know, work through this. If if the the VA is not the right fit for you for for whatever reason, there are other organizations. There are other people out there who are providing uh, this type of service. And like Virginia said earlier, uh, type in type in the type of uh, treatment option that you think would work work for you and your zip code and and. Google will tell you where to go and, and, and figure out, you know, what the, the best uh, course of action is. Um, you know, there, there's so many people out there. Uh, don't, don't go it alone. Um, it's, it's much easier when, when you're not carrying this burden by yourself. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a real privilege to talk to you. Um, love your book. I'm a big fan girl. Thank you for sharing your story and for inspiring other people to do the same. It's, it's, it's badass. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and, and share uh, your work and, and everything that you're doing. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. This, thank you for caring. Thanks for listening to the drive on podcast. If you want to check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, driveonpodcast.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Drive On Podcast. 